Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. This is Brett, and welcome back to the Online Great Books Podcast. Today, a return to... Plato and a discussion of sophistry. Did you know thousands of years ago sophistry was a big problem? Scott and Carl will tackle that subject today. Thanks for listening. We'll get right to it. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about uh, Plato's maybe spurious dialogues, greater and lesser Hippias, or greater Hippias and Hippias. Depends on who you talk to. Major and minor hippias. Or maybe hippias and lesser hippias. See? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there are two dialogues that, that Plato wrote that have the same character, Hippias, who is a sophist. Scott, what's a sophist? He says what he needs to say in order to teach you something so that he can take money from you. There you go. Does he have to actually teach you anything? No. No, but he does have to get paid. Yeah. But and he and he always claims that he taught you something, the sophists yeah. do. But if you ask him what he exactly taught you, maybe you can't figure it out. So Socrates says, "Here comes Hippias, fine and wise. How long it's been since you put in into Athens? You you know you're in trouble when Socrates calls you wise, because the the fist is coming, the intellectual <laughs> fist is coming. Hippias is one of the awfulest people Socrates speaks to. What? He's wise. He 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 know, he doesn't know anybody who's superior to him. Yeah, I know. How could he not be a great person? Well, he makes more money than anyone else, so that is a measure of his greatness. He tells Socrates that. Carl, these folks yes. need to go and get on the email list. Like we tell them every time, and they don't do it. They need to go leave a review at Google, the Google whatever, or the. I don't know. Wherever you listen to it, go leave a a favorable review. Go uh, pass the show on to somebody. Uh, Go listen to the Music and Ideas show. The the downloads for the Music and Ideas show are about 20% of what they are for this show. Which means there's 80% of you who aren't listening to it. And that show is 50% better because we have another guy on there. Right. So that means you're... Wait a minute. So... If there's 80% that aren't listening, that means it's 20%, but it's 50% better. How does that work out? Well, they're getting a lot more value. So the more of you that download, the less the people that listen now are going to get. Mm, See how okay. that works? It's a zero-sum game. Everything is. And then, if you care, Trent and I are working on a zine. And if you know what it is, then you know. And if you don't, then you want to know. And if you want in on the zine... You need to go to scotthamburg.com and scroll down to the bottom and sign up on the email list, and then I'll let you know when it's ready. It's going to be really awful, and that's why you want it. I bought a mimeograph machine. <laughs> yeah, I can't say anything more about that. I might make an appearance in the zine. It's going to be a mimeographed zine, guys. But I'm going to put it in the mail, so when you get it, that good mimeograph smell will be gone already. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You need to get the special envelopes that will preserve the smell. Put it in a Ziploc bag and then send it? Yeah. That's the whole reason I would pay is to get the smell. Well, you can come and crank, turn the handle. It's it's manual, Carl. It's like this. A.B. Dick <laughs> Company, 1968 mimeograph machine. Ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. Yeah, so each zine that you get is going to be the product of actual physical labor. Yeah. And to be fair, it's not a mimeograph machine. It's a fluid uh, duplicator. A fluid duplicator. Yes. So the mimeograph uses a mimeograph stencil, and you can't get those stencils anymore. No one makes those. Uh, But the spirit duplicator, you use a carbon stencil, and then this methanol solvent picks up that that, that carbon and deposits it on the uh, paper, it makes the makes the duplicate for you. And they're only good for maybe 50 to 100 copies, and you have to use another. 
another stencil, another master. So uh, we'll be making multiple masters, you know, because, you know, we may have, you know, we're going to send out 12 or 15,000 of these, I'm sure. Hmm. Hmm. That's a lot of conchunks. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great fun. Yeah. So we should go back to Hippias. Hippias, the sophist, who is the best sophist. So they make this point in this dialogue. Uh, I think this is one of the funnier ones. Socrates says, it's really like the improvements in other skills, isn't it? Where early craftsmen are worthless compared to modern ones. Should we say that your skill, the skill of the sophists, has been improved in the same way and that the ancients were worthless compared to you in wisdom? In other words, are you the smartest person ever? You're the wisest person ever. And Hippias says, yes, certainly. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I didn't like this right, right off the bat. You know, everybody thinks that the new stuff's better and that the new scientists are smarter and, you know, whatever. Fill in the blank. It just It's just, I wrote here, progressivism. I wrote that right there. You can see. <laughs> Look at that. <sighs> well, so that, that's a, quite a claim to think that, that you are wiser than everybody that came before you. Of course, it is the progressive claim, but... It's actually the basis of progressivism. You have to think that you're wiser than everybody else. Let me be the progressive. The progressive would say, oh, no, no, Carl. It's not that we're wiser. We have knowledge available to us that wasn't available before, and we have tools available to us that have never been before. And computing power is one of those, for example. So we can use this knowledge and these tools to reach new heights of humanness that were never before possible. I disagree. I don't think that's the way they argue. I think the okay. way they argue is that we're better people. I certainly do hear that. I, I did a live stream not too long ago when, you know, somebody was, you know, making that, who is that angels of our better nature book? Who was that? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I don't that know. POS, you know, that they're making the argument that we have like evolved morally. Yeah. Which is a, a, a nice claim to make because it means that you that you who live now are better than all your ancestors. Right. And all you had to do was be born now because you've evolved morally. That didn't take any work on your part. Steven Pinker, Better Angels of Our Nature. I have read a Steven Pinker book, but not that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I heard about that one. Yeah. That, that we're somehow better. And he's got stats in there about violence. But the the thing about that book is it really matters what you count as violence. Right. Well, drone strikes aren't violence. No. You know, and if, if they just turned to pink mist, like, was it really violence? Right, right. And uh, terminating pregnancies is not violence. Right, listen, clumps of cells, it's not violence. What's up? So if you don't count them, then I guess there's less violence. And in addition, so all I did was read the, the, the wiki article on this. I didn't read the actual book. If you don't consider that the great big stick that is keeping everybody's better angels is Hiroshima. Right. Hmm. Okay. We haven't had a huge war since we built these bombs that could blow up cities. Yeah, we, well, we don't have to. We're better people now, and we have um, unrestricted warfare. So, you know, it's not really violent, but everything you do is coercive. Like, from, you know, buying toothpaste to... Well, because we're better. Right. Because science... Well, I think Hippias is actually more honest than, say, Stephen Pinker. And I, honestly, the book of his that I did read, which I think was The Language Instinct, I really liked it. I thought it was interesting. You're always so generous. I'm really tired of that. <laughs> well, sorry. The The argument that Hippias has for him being the, the best is he's made the most money. Yep. Socrates, you haven't the slightest idea how fine this could be. If you knew how much money I've made, you'd be amazed. Take one case. I went to Sicily once when Protagoras was visiting there. He was famous then and an older man. Though I was younger, I made much more than 150 minus in a short time and from one very small place. You like my hippiest voice? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I almost think I've made... Let me do a hippie, hippiest voice. <clears throat> All right, got to clench my jaw. I almost think I've made more money than any other two sophists you like put together. Hmm. How's that? Sounds like a straight William F. Buckley. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> so, 
yeah, in a way, sophistry has progressed. Sophistry is big business. It makes you very, very wealthy. In the old days, it did not. Anaxagoras did not make any money. In fact, he, he lost everything. He's one of these early thinkers. He come up with the most came up with the notion of mind as um, somehow guiding the universe. And, uh, well, he died penniless. He didn't do a very good job. How wise was he? Right, because, um, see, Carl, profit is a measure of the good you have rendered to your fellow man. So if your ideas are good and they render good to your fellow man, you will receive profit. You see? Mm -hmm. And if you don't receive profit, then either your ideas aren't good or you aren't good and do, have, do not have the virtue necessary to prosecute your ideas. Right. So the mark of being wise is when someone makes the most money. Well, you can make money from everybody. Except the Spartans. Except the good old Spartans. Yeah. You are powerless for the sons of the Spartans. They're not interested. Why weren't they interested? Because they were law-abiding. So if you're following along with us, the works of Plato have margin numbers that are universal for anybody who studies Plato. I think they're called Stephanus numbers. And that refers to an edition of Plato that was put out in the Renaissance, complete edition. So you'd get a page number and then letters, which are different parts. I guess it's a folio page. You'd flip the page open. So when I tell Scott at uh, you know, 283E, he can find it. And so can you. Sparta is really law-abiding. Of course, says Hippias. And what's most highly prized in law-abiding cities is virtue. Of course. Well, this starts to get weird because Hippias is supposed to be selling virtue. Well, why isn't it that Sparta doesn't want what he's selling? Well, as Hippias tells us, 284b, an ancestral tradition of the Spartans, Socrates, forbids them to change their laws <laughs> or to give their sons any education contrary to established customs. And I wrote, I call for this now. Can't change the laws? For how long? Forever. Who cares? Well, but wait, how could that be a good thing? Well, if the laws are just, they are just. Because see, see, I don't believe in progressivism. I don't believe that everything's changing. I think that the good is good without respect to time or technology. And if the law is good, it will always be good. Well, and even if the law wasn't good, it's predictable. Right. Knowing the game rules and playing the game according to those rules and not having people move the goalposts on us all the time. <laughs> Is You're a, trying not to swear anymore. It's a great advantage. Are you working on virtue? Are you trying to... I try. I've cut out a set of cuss words. And I've had a pretty good run, darn it, <laughs> of not using that that subset of cuss words. Maybe you need some substitute cuss words. Consarn it, those kinds. I knew a girl, she would say, oh, sugar. Yeah. When she was mad, the sugar and goalposts get moved. And it's very hard to, uh, well, to have an ancestral tradition. Uh, I mean, oh, the last couple of years, uh, huge changes, unpredictable changes. I don't like it. Yeah. So let's be politically agnostic, you and I, listener. Let's say it's absolutely a deadlock certainty and necessary that everything gets locked down again this Thanksgiving. How many Novembers can we do that and maintain a Thanksgiving tradition that someone would recognize in 1975? I think it's already gone. I think it's gone too. By the way, Carl, I did a uh, School Sucks podcast with uh, Uncle Brett the other day, and he cut this part off and told people if they wanted to hear the rest of it, they should go behind the paywall. <laughs> So you should go behind the paywall, but I want to give it to you. And Brett's an engineer, so he's listening to this 
gnashing his As teeth. As you undercut him? Right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people didn't have a Thanksgiving last year, uh, and 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 he and I have both had people email us that said, Uncle, Uncle Steve is going to require everyone to have the Fauci ouchie to go to Thanksgiving, and I don't want to do that. What should I do? And my answer is, don't go to Thanksgiving, but if Uncle Steve's Thanksgiving dinner is at 2, then you send an invitation to everyone that says, you hope they have a great time, but if they'd like to come by for hors d'oeuvres and something, whatever, board games at 7, you'll be hosting them then. And some people will show up, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Uncle seems reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Don't get mad about it. Respect his wishes and do your own thing. Yeah. Try to build your own thing. And then, you know, you do that for 20 years, uh, hors d'oeuvres and uh, board games at your house will be the thing. Just takes 20 or 30, 40, 50, 70, 100, 200, 300, 400 years to do a, to create a tradition. But, you know, it's the best time to start a tradition is yesterday. The next best time is today, Carl. Yeah, so there's a story... Um... I probably get this wrong, but Solon, who was the lawgiver of Athens, he made all these laws for them, and uh, he said, "Don't change the laws till I get back." And then he left town, right? And he never came back. Yep. That I think that's very important. We don't. Uh, I mean, I'm focusing on this one thing on this dialogue. Uh, I think you're supposed to notice the Spartans at the beginning that they're not interested in what Hippias is selling. And they are, of course, the ones that won the war that is going on at the time that this is happening. That they don't change their laws, and their laws aren't aren't entirely great, but they didn't change them. We have this thought that we always have to be progressing. We always have to be moving. If you're not moving, you're dying. And imagine you did this, as I'm, I'm reading up on gardening these days, imagine if you did this with your plants, which have a set way in which they thrive. But you take that pot and you keep moving it around your house. So one day it's in the southern exposure, the next day it's on the north side and doesn't get any light. Sometimes it has plenty of water, sometimes it doesn't. How well is that plant going to do? Well, it needs Bronto. It has electrolytes that plants crave. <laughs> All right, but even, let's say you get it you're screwing up my analogy. <laughs> well, well, no, I'm not. I'm being the progressive. I'm, I keep, I, or, you know, I've created a problem by moving shit around, and then I want to do something else because of the problem I already created. Yeah, so you have to, you, you create something else to solve the problem that you created by not letting it just be stable and thrive. Now, the Greek word for happiness that, well, that Aristotle uses is eudaimonia, which you could tra- translate as thriving. It's doing well. To do well, you have to be planted. That's my analogy. And if you put that plant, let's say it, it, you put that plant on the north side of your house and it should have been on the south side. If you just left it alone, it would probably come to an agreement with the environment and grow reasonably well. If you just didn't keep moving it. This is interesting that you are bearing down on the Spartan point here. Do you think Plato wrote this? I'm 90% sure. Think so? It's a little too funny for him. I, I think it's too funny, and I and I think I think Socrates is a little too snarky too. But who knows? It's still it's still pretty 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 decent. It's not the finest. It's Platonish. Yeah, it's not the finest of these uh, dialogues. But Socrates and maybe Plato, <laughs> I don't know. Right? They might be Platonists, right? They they. <laughs> They might believe in the forms, but they definitely believe that there's such a thing as truth. Um, they might not. We might not know what it is, and in fact, it might not even be accessible to us necessarily. But they both they believe it's true that it exists, and if it exists, uh, not only do they think it exists, but they also think it is that it is immutable and doesn't change. Mm-hmm. If that's how you are then that should have consequences for the kind of political system you come up with. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that that's how how truth be, or how truth bees, then you would only change a law or your political system 
if you found out that it was contrary to truth. Right. You would have to admit of errors, I would think. Maybe the Spartans mm -hmm. didn't, but I think you would have to admit of errors. But when you and I create our, our, our monarchy and make John the king, if we're going to amend a law or if we're going to change it or delete it, we're going to, not only are we going to have to have some process that where, whereby you do that, you know, you ratify something or somebody signs a paper, but I think you'll have to show in writing, you have to show your work and show why the other law was in error and what the truth has been discovered to be and how the new law will be in line with that truth. Well, all right, that's a pr presumption of truth, which changes your politics. I think we currently go in the presumption of power. Different groups get in power and are going to make laws to promote themselves. Right. But I think you ought to, if you're going to make a change in a law, so, so we drive on the right side of the road in this country. You mean the usually. correct side? Well, what if I could show you that in fact, the left side would be better. Better? All right, so I'd have to make an argument. I don't know. It's more efficient. There's fewer left, there's more left turns than right turns, and it's easier to turn left from the left lane. I don't know. We'd come up with a reason. Big traffic would come up with a reason. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And so you'd say, well, all right, that's good. I think we ought to change that law. That's not the only consideration you have to make. You have 320 million people or so, whatever the population is of this country, who drive on the right side. And you change the law, and now you've got a lot of crashes, a lot of pain. The cars have the wheels on the wrong side for left-handed driving. And so the change that you make, it's whatever positive good you get out of it by hewing it a little closer to truth... It, you have to subtract from it the negative effects. It's like, a, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a strength coach. I'm thinking of the fitness fatigue model. Mm. Performance equals fitness minus fatigue. That's why we taper you going into a meet. So we get the fatigue to go down so the performance goes up. Well, the law is like the positive good minus the disruption. Because even if it's a good law, it's going to be disruptive. Right. And... Nobody seems to care about that, or they they don't pay any attention to it, or they, you know, they say, "I'm trying to think of a good swear word." Concert. That I don't want to say. <laughs> See, they say, "Fudge those people." Right. We don't care about them. They're backwards hicks anyway who are driving on the wrong side of the road. Good laws are disruptive, and in fact, you want them for the disruptive effect. Uh, well, you change it because there's something that needs to be disrupted. Right. But it's also. I mean, it's a huge change in everybody's way of life. Hmm. And uh, there might be unforeseen effects. You know, in other words, I'm with the Spartans, and I think their laws are kind of lousy, actually. They had some problems later on. You know, we know about the Spartans. They were... Uh, yeah, but there were their that many laws. Spartans. There weren't that many Spartans. They had helots that did all their work, and they had to keep going back to keep the helots down, and they didn't have enough Spartan babies, so in the end, they just kind of ran out of Spartans. Huh. You know, there might have been some changes you'd want to make, but change for change's sake is not a Spartan thing, and I think they're right about that. And they have no use for Hippias, at least as Plato reports. He did do some well teaching histories. They were very interested in him teaching. Did you catch him making fun of them about geometry? Yeah, they can't even count. <laughs> yeah, Socrates says, uh, then do they enjoy hearing about geometry? No, many of them can't even, well, count. Those hicks. Yeah. They probably like NASCAR. Yeah, I don't like that stuff. I'm with you on that. On the next page there at two, in, in 286, Socrates introduces his opponent. And this is the only time I see this. I may be wrong. It's been a while since I've read all of it. All, all the Play-Doh. I'll, I'll just read this. I think it, it's, it's clever. I don't know. I enjoy this little, this little uh, device. Socrates says, certainly, Hippias, if all goes well, but now answer me a short question about that. It's a fine thing, you reminded me. 
Just now, someone got me badly struck when I was finding fault with parts of some speeches for being foul and praising other parts as fine. He questioned me this way, really insultingly. Socrates, how do you know what sorts of things are fine and foul? Look, would you be able to say what the fine is? And I, I, I'm so worthless, I was struck, and I wasn't able to answer him properly. As I left the gathering, I was angry and blamed myself, and I made a threatening resolve that when, whomever of you wise men I met first, I would listen and learn and study, then return to the questioner and fight the argument back. So, as I say, it's a fine thing you came now. Teach me enough about what the fine is itself, and try to answer me with the greatest precision possible, so I won't be a laughing stock again for having been refuted a second time. The questioner. The opponent, Carl. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, Plato kind of gives up the story a little bit. Let's see here at about 298, somewhere in there. He says that this, the questioner, Saphroniscus's son, well, mm -hmm. th that's Socrates. The questioner, it's him. Now, so did Socrates think that it was getting too adversarial with Hippias? So he had to act like this was coming from somebody else? Well, you know, this is exactly, uh, you know, I have the same friend. <laughs> right. And he's Sophroniscus' son, and he sits in my head and he says, well, we were talking earlier about whether recorded music is evil, and I'm thinking, well, what is evil? Right. You can't even get to your question yet. You know, that's what Socrates does to you. And it, it's funny that it did it to him, too. Yeah. I don't know. It could be a clue that this isn't isn't quite Plato. You know, putting that extra layer of distance is a way to say uh, Plato didn't really write this. Yeah, but you know, they've got the what Eleatic Stranger and yeah, and Diotima from the Symposium. You put the hot stuff in somebody else's yeah mind. Yeah, so this really turns into some meaty Socrates stuff right here. He he wants to know what what is fine and what is what is not. Well, he wants to know what fair, qua fair it is. Yeah, and the occasion is, if Hippias says, well, they like, uh, the Spartans don't like, you know, the usual stuff that I sell, but they do like stories of fine activities. Yeah. Okay, well, what makes them fine? You know, if you're a sophist and you're doing the Sparta circuit, <laughs> you need to know what to go in with. And fine, the word for fine is kalos in Greek. It's uh, on the back of our T-shirt. Noble things are difficult. Um, it's a uh, yeah. Pascarella. opposite is kakos, which I find funny because people still call baby poop kaka. Mm. I think that's funny. 3,000-year-old word. Pascarella translates that word not fine or fair, but noble. Yeah, which is a reasonably good translation of it. Yeah. It's more than just pretty. So there, let me see here, 287C, we start with this, the, the, the classic Socrates stuff. If you guys haven't ever read any of this, you've, you've got to go read it. It's, it's just, he's, he's the best writer ever, Plato. Socrates is the best teacher ever, and they're dealing with all the, be the worst, best, most difficult problems ever. It, it's... It's just the fine. It's it's most fair. And if you join us, by the way, if you get on our mailing list and then join us, you will get, as at no extra cost to you beyond the cost of membership, the complete works of Plato. Yeah. Big and some people to read it with. And we can beat each other up over these ideas. Pa Socrates says, uh, now, since it's your command, let me be the man as best as I can and try to question you. So he's saying he wants to be. He's gonna. He's gonna play the role of his opponent for Hippias. If you displayed that speech to him, the one you mentioned about the fine activities, he'd listen. And when you stop speaking, he'd ask not about anything else, but about the fine. That's a sort of habit with him. And he'd say, "Oh, visitor from Ellis, is it not by justice that people are just?" Answer Hippias as if he were the questioner. I shall answer that it is by justice. And is this justice something? Very much so, Socrates. And by wisdom, wise people are wise. And by the good, all good things are good. Hippias says, how could they be otherwise? By these each being something. Of course, it can't be that they're not. They are. 
then all fine things too are fine by the fine. Isn't that so? Yes, by the fine. By that being something, it is. And here comes the hammer. Well, this is all right. The hammer's coming, but he put the anvil under him. (laughs) (laughs) You know, he he just, with those questions, and he does this over and over and over again, and all these dialogues, he's nailing down a rudimentary metaphysics between him and that interlocutor. Like, what are things? How do we know what they are? And he's setting all the groundwork. I mean, a lot of people would say he's laid a trap, but I don't think that's true. It's not a trap. He's essentially defined some some relationships. He hasn't defined terms, but he's defined relationships between uh, subjects and predicates here. And, and you have to consider he's talking to Hippias, who is a sophist who makes money teaching people to be um, good at politics, basically. This is the way they would talk. Politicians will talk about justice as if it is a thing. Won't they? Yeah. For justice's sake, we must change the law so that you drive on the left side. In other words, justice is a real thing that is motivating the change in the law. Well, okay, great, wonderful. What is that thing? Right. It's um, equity. Okay, what's equity? You know, and you dig in deeper and you find out that often the, the words, they're using words as if there are forms but they don't know what they are. Should we talk about what a form is? Uh, sure. Yeah, in outline, a form is, it's a, a metaphysical entity, not a physical entity for that, that Socrates talks about sometimes that is the answer to the question of why things are just because of justice. Sometimes we'll say justice itself. Uh, why are things good? Because of the good. They partake, the cause. In, they partake in the form of goodness. Yeah. And form is a visual word. I think in Greek it's idea usually, which comes from the word to see. And I was uh, I was reading a, a gardening book the other day, Forager's Handbook or something by Samuel Thayer. Just picked up three books set. And he actually reminded me of your Uncle Henry. And he's saying that you need to learn to identify these plants. You need to look at them. You need to get this image of this plant in all of its stages of growth. And and once you have this image, you won't ever mistake it again. Well, what he's talking about to me is the form. You need to get the form of the cattail. And you get it by looking at it. It's a lot easier with a cattail, which are apparently edible, than it is with justice. Yeah, so there, uh, the cattail, there are things universal to all cattails, and the keen observer who sees enough of those cattails will miraculously, we don't know how this works, we don't know how any epistemology stuff works, we don't know how this goes, but somehow comes to recognize enough of those universals about the cattail to see cattailness when it's there. Mm-hmm. And to recognize when it is not there, which is even crazier. Yeah, there's an awful lot in that somehow. There's a whole lot in that somehow. In the philosophy of science, this is the problem of induction. Right, which is garbage. (laughs) What, the problem of induction or philosophy of science? Induction. You don't think it happens? It doesn't seem to. I mean, it happens. It happens, but how good is it? (sighs) Uh, Well, I don't know. Do you know what a pecan tree is? Kind of. So we were walking around your your place, and I'm like, that's a pecan, that's a pecan, that's a pecan. And in my mind, I'm like, that's kind of a weird pecan. Well, it wasn't. I've I've since I've since seen that you've got some you got some other other weird trees on there that weren't mm-hmm. pecans. They're not weird trees, but they weren't pecans. How do you know? You're like, okay, this is a compound leaf. It has a, a curly margin. And it's got bark like this and whatever. Well, and how would you figure it out? You'd, you'd look at a few trees. There's a point to this, dear reader. 
you look at a few trees and you say, well, this is clearly a pecan. Well, how do we know? Because it, it, it grew pecans. And this one looks like it, but let's do some divisions. And so we look at, at the, the way the leaves are presented. Are they, I don't know all the words on this, but are they alternate or are they... Right. Opposite. Even. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you say, well, this is very similar, but there's a difference there. And so you're working genus and species and, and the species are divided up through the differences. And it might be a little tedious, but then you end up with a pretty good picture, which is what a form is, a pretty good picture of what a pecan is. But but here's the problem. Here's this other tree, this ash tree, very similar in morphology, uh, but it doesn't make the nut. Okay, that was not a pecan. Similar though. Well, here's this walnut, and then here's this hickory. Okay, well, this hickory tree, the leaves are significantly different, but they do make nuts. Well, here's this walnut. Oh, they're a lot alike. A lot alike. Mm -hmm. Are they partaking in another form, a, a higher form that supersedes the pecanness or the walnutness that makes them like? Right. So if you're going to say they're all trees, they must share in something that makes them to be a tree. Otherwise, the word doesn't mean anything. So people people get upset by the forms, and and they think this is metaphysical mumbo jumbo. Mm -mm. Well, sure, maybe, but if there's not such a thing as treeness, then I all that stuff in my yard, I can't look at it and say they're trees. Each one is an individual, and then you can't have knowledge. Okay, so I can study trees. I can get a book on trees, which will give me features common to all trees that presumes that there is such a thing as a tree if there's not a tree i can't have that book and uh knowledge becomes impossible science becomes impossible and uh we're kind of stuck well now, with trees it's a lot easier than with justice or wisdom or the fine it seems easier here's the horrible part so if you've got this pecanness or treeness what is that which partakes in it? What do you mean? The, the individual tree? Well, that, I, isn't that the problem in the Parmenides? Like, okay, so you, simply, you essentially have all these predicates. Like, you know, Aristotle gives us a language and makes some sense out of this stuff. So you've got these predicates, you know. It's a hardwood tree, you know, where hardwood is predicated of the tree, whatever. What is the blank matter which takes the form on? Or takes on the predicate, you know what? What is the subject? What is the, what is the being that takes that on? Like, is there an existence that is extant without predicate? That dig it? Yeah, not in my experience. You can't see it. You only ever see trees, right? But they seem to grow out of stuff, and so we have a category. Um, well, Aristotle calls it matter. Actually, the German for it is stuff, which I think is funny. Mm. But you never you never just see stuff by itself. Right. It's always formed. It's always something. But the tree, you know, the oak tree in my out, out front is uh, growing in the dirt and it's taking in water and sunlight and air and becoming a bigger tree. So supplying so treeness to the stuff that's coming in. So so back to the fine, later on he talks about spoons and which ones are fine or or justice or whatever. Underlying that whole thing, all of his approach is that that there is a, a kind of a a blank matter that takes on fineness. Mm hmm You might say it's formless. You might. That's what it would mean to be without form. Yeah. There's uh, a formless is... matter that then is partakes in different forms and uh, then is bit greater or lesser fair or foul or you know whatever or pecan yeah tree. yeah so weird <laughs> well and it's a whole lot easier for us to do the example of the tree than it is for us to talk about these examples of justice and wisdom and uh fineness which are a, a tree is a concrete thing that I can go touch justice is not something that I can go touch there's a billboard out here 
I drive by it in Chicago. And it's something like, direct action until justice just is. <sighs> what does that mean? It's such... So what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's a slogan. But, okay, Mr. Bulletin Board, tell me, what do they call them on the... It's not bulletin boards. Billboards. Billboard, yeah. Mr. Billboard, tell me what justice is when it just is. They're presuming that there is such a thing. Well, okay, then we ought to be able to figure it out. Yeah. After all, you must be wise, Billboard, because you use the word as if you know what it means. If I could talk to you like Socrates does, and you are a person, I could say, well, then you, you must be very wise because you use the word justice as if it has a, a firm meaning. Could you enlighten me? I am just poor Carl from the South Side. I don't, I don't, I'm not very smart. Help me out. This is what Socrates does. Well, how do these people generally do when <laughs> they encounter him? Well, he doesn't do well. Nobody does well with this. Yeah, so then why should we do it? Well, to disabuse you of the idea that you know anything. Uh, and to keep you from making unjust laws. Yeah, that might be a good thing. So the, the uh, people get upset. A lot of, a lot of Platonic dialogues are negative. They don't give you an answer. So you want to know, can virtue be taught, for example, in the Mino, and you get to the end, and you're just not sure. There's no answer. And you get frustrated. Why don't we, why don't you just tell us what to think? Well, if he told you what to think, you wouldn't be thinking. Socrates genuinely doesn't know what to tell you anyway. Right. And so what is your takeaway from these dialogues? Well, the takeaway might be you shouldn't ought to do the thing you've been doing. So I... I one of the classic ones is called the Euthyphro. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it's ancient Greek, so sue me. And this guy comes in and says, "I he's putting his father on trial for murder. And it's an ambiguous case. It was one slave that killed another slave, and uh, dad put him in a ditch to wait for the magistrate to tell him, tell him what to do, and the guy died in the ditch. It's not, strictly speaking, murder. Or maybe it is. You know, that's part of the things you think about when you read it. And Socrates says, are you sure? And Euthyphro says, well, of course I'm sure. After all, it's what the gods do. Socrates is very impressed. You must be wise. You know everything that, that is uh, precious to the gods. Why, yes, I do. I'd be worthless if I didn't. And then you get to the end of the dialogue and find out Euthyphro doesn't know what piety is. Socrates doesn't give an answer either, although there's some interesting directions he could go. And at the end, Socrates is like clutching at him. Don't go. Don't go. <laughs> Teach me. You said you knew this stuff. And you, right. you the first, look at the time. I got to head out. Well, where does he go? Does he go to prosecute his father or does he perhaps go to say, huh, I don't really know what I was talking about. We knoweth not. That might be the preferred outcome. That you the first, not be so quick. <laughs> to make this judgment against his dad when he really doesn't know. And so Hippias, who makes a living selling fine things to the Spartans, but doesn't know what they are, maybe he shouldn't do that? You know, maybe you are, um, I don't know, you're a record executive. Uh-oh. And, uh... I'm sorry for you, but maybe you're a record executive and you've got this opportunity. Here's this, this uh, cute girl. Her name is Brittany. Uh, I could sell fine things. After all, she's cute and everything. And you sell these, these uh, songs of her singing age inappropriate stuff and videos. And you know what I mean? And you're selling fine things to people Maybe they're not fine. Maybe they're not really beautiful. Maybe you shouldn't ought to be doing it. If you just didn't think that you knew everything, you might have some caution. You know, Plato would say something like, well, Socrates would say something, I dare not do this lest I offend the gods. No, we got to do it. I don't know. Is Britney Spears a bridge too far in a, in a Plato podcast? No, no, not at all. So to the Britney Hit Spears point. One more time. 289A. 
Don't you know that what Heraclitus says holds good? The finest of monkeys is foul put together with another class, and the finest of pots is foul put together with the class of girls. So Hippias the wise, isn't that so Hippias? Of course. What, if you put the class of girls together with the class of gods, won't the same thing happen as happened when the class of pots was put together with that of the class of girls? Won't the finest girl be seen to be foul? Yeah, because a, l- a little bit earlier there, uh, uh, Hippias says, well, hot chicks are fine, like in absolute terms. A fine girl is a fine thing. Right. Yeah, okay, whatever. Translation. You know, right. But then he says, well, what compared to, compared to the gods... Is, would that be true? So should we agree, Hippias, that the finest girl is foul compared to the class of gods? Who would object to that, Socrates? So now we're dealing with problems of comparison. You know, are we defining things by their relationship to something else? So is uh, there's another, I can't remember which one it is, there's another dialogue where they talk about bigness and smallness, the snubness of a nose. Like those things are all defined in relation to other things. And those are big problems. And in fact, that's really, that's really kind of one of the problems with identifying the, the trees. Now, if you go down like a workflow in a tree identification guide, um, you don't really, you're not comparing them to other trees, but that's not how our minds work. We look over there across the field and you say, Hmm, that must be an Oak because, it looks like these other oaks and then you get closer and then you can figure out if it's a post oak or a red oak or a schumard oak or whatever. Uh, those problems of defining things in, a, in relation to other things is, is hard. Um, but that's how, that's how the brain works. Like uh, Malachi told us, you know, we, we know things by Malachi's tripod. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you listened to that show? I was on the show. That's not what I asked. No. Not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like listening to myself. I always listen so I, I I don't tell the stories. And I only want to tell them a half dozen times before I retire them. And I make sure I don't tell them too many. Yeah, I, I just don't. I don't like listening to myself. I sound weird. Or what if I sound better than I actually am? You know, then I have something I have to live up to. Now, wait a minute. If you sound better than you actually are, and you do it all the time, aren't you better than you were? <laughs> yeah, but the one I actually am is the one that's inside my mind, not oh. the one that's on the podcast. Saphroniscus' son. Right. Uh, then at some point, Hippias says, well, gold is fine. Everything is, hands- is enhanced by gold. It, it's fine. It must be gold. Right. Not a bad answer. Seems reasonable. So Socrates brings up a very famous uh, sculptor. You can see some of his stuff even now. His name is Phidias. I believe, the, I'm sure it's all in the British Museum. So Socrates says, well, do you think Phidias didn't know about this fine thing you mentioned? The point is that Phidias didn't make Athena's eyes out of gold. So he made the big statue of Athena in uh, the Parthenon. Nor the rest of her face, nor her feet, nor her hands, as he would have done if gold really would have made them seem to be the finest. But he made them out of ivory. Apparently he went wrong through ignorance. He didn't know gold was what made everything fine wherever it is added. This idea of gold making everything fine, it's like uh, when I was, this was back in the late 70s. And if you were a fancy person, you would have your house. There were things that you would put in your house. And one of them is mirrors. And the other one is like gold leaf everywhere, gold tracery. You would have mirrors with the gold in them. Yep. That would be classy. <laughs> classy. That's such a dumb word. <laughs> well, okay, but there might be too much gold. And so we have a new concept here. Or inappropriate use of gold. An inappropriate use of gold. Yeah. Uh, what would the appropriate use of gold be? In my circuits? Money to make the conductivity go well. Uh, money, money. Uh, perhaps a chalice in a church, which is supposed to be. Well, it's non-reactive. I think is the real reason they're used, but certainly not as a, some sort of tracing on a mirror or the little flakes of gold that you get in Goldschlager. Right. 
just a trick. It's dumb. So we're making judgments here. At some points, gold would be appropriate. At other points, say, um, applying gold leaf makeup to your face for the masquerade. Come on. Yeah. That, that's no good, is it? Right? That'd be yeah. crazy. It depends on how ugly they are. Well, the thing is, the thing about if you're if you're ugly, putting more stuff on doesn't make you not ugly. Hmm. Can anything make you less ugly? Um, well, you could be clean. You can be healthy. You can uh, be hmm. of good virtue. <laughs> right. But she's still ugly. Terry Pratchett wrote a book about witches, and so there's these little girls that want to be witches, so they're going goth. And the one girl, there, there's the pretty girl, and then there's the one that's tagging along, and... and uh, Pratchett says, well, if she couldn't be beautiful, at least she would look sick. <laughs> I always find something nice to say. <laughs> yeah. Go listen to our Terry Pratchett show, uh, dear listener. So we have this thing of appropriate, and I think this is a big clue to where you might want to go with the fine. So... Why didn't you work the middles of the eyes out of ivory? He used stone, and you found stone that resembled ivory as closely as possible. Isn't stone a fine thing, too, if it's a fine one? Shall we agree? Yes. Yes, at least when it's appropriate. So the next page. We'll agree to this. Whatever is appropriate to each thing makes that particular thing fine. This is an important chunk. I think that's pretty good. Well, you would, because you're an Aristotelian. <laughs> I thought I was a Platonist. You're a weird match mashup of I know. Plato Arist Plato Stilvian. I don't know. <sighs> Aristolatonist. I don't know. Yeah, uh, they're getting out of Telos, right? Mm-hmm. Socrates goes on to say, Hey, what if we're making this delicious bean soup and we're stirring it? Would it be a, a gold spoon? Would that be finer than a fig wood spoon? Well, I imagine if I stirred my soup with a gold spoon, that the heat of the soup would travel up the spoon handle through the very conductive metal and burn my hand. Yeah, uh, I would. I can imagine that would be. Socrates says something interesting, which is a little glimpse uh, back through time into their culture and their world. Uh, he says, you know, I didn't even think about this, but he says, it makes the, sp the fig wood spoon, he says, it makes the soup smell better. And at the same time, my friend, it won't break our pot, spill out the soup, and put out the fire. Yeah, if you get a metal spoon and you have to cook in pottery and you bang it into the side of the pot, the thing cracks and you lose your meal. Hmm. I never thought of that. I've never cooked in a... Now I want to make a figwood spoon. I know. Make your soup smell better. I, I don't know if it would actually make your soup smell better, but you know that kind of hot metal smell? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a copper spoon would probably make your bean soup smell bad. Uh, my cast iron skillets don't. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> anyway, the figwood spoon is clearly the finer and fairer of the spoons because of its fitness for the job. Right. And so the clue here is if I put the two spoons in front of you, the, the gold spoon, so back before COVID, we would, in our church, we give communion with the spoon and it's always, it's a gold spoon. To put that one next to the, the wooden spoon. You don't use a wooden spoon. It's not fitted for the job. But if I just put those in in uh, isolation on a table and said, which one is finer? Which one is more beautiful? Most people will pick the gold spoon. Yeah, but but in that instance, it's being judged based on its decorative value. Yeah. Not on its spooniness. Yeah, if you say, why do you prefer the gold spoon? Well, because it's shiny. Right. It's uh, It's got clarity to it. It reflects well. Uh, and then you you have to say, well, no, for stirring my bean soup, which one is finer? Or you're going to grab the wooden one. For giving communion in a in a church, which one is better? Well, the gold one. For, as a hedge against inflation, which one is better? 
<laughs> yeah. So the fineness, if you attach it to appropriateness, then we have to ask the next question. What for? What's the spoon for? And then you can get all kinds of, of information out of it. Gold's at seventeen fifty an ounce. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure I agree with him there. So when you see the, well, let's go back to their example of the fine girl. When you see the pretty girl. This is going to get us into dangerous waters. Let's when go. When one says that she is fine, do we mean that she is appropriate? And for what is she appropriate? Girlness. Is it is it beauty itself or is is there some purpose to it? I think there's both. Yeah, I do too. I think uh, a lot of what men find beautiful in women are fertility cues. Mm -hmm. Hip, you know, hip to waist ratio, that sort of thing. Like black hair. <laughs> That's your theory. For more on my theory about uh, the evolutionary fitness of the black haired female versus the blonde haired female, check out Music and Ideas Show on Joe Cocker's album. Mad Men, Mad Dogs, and Englishmen. There you go. <laughs> yes, you could be one of the 20%. Yes. Make it 21%. But on the other hand, uh, there are, sometimes there's just beauty. And you're not feeling any evolutionary demands towards procreation at that point. Yeah, I know. I know that's true. You want to know how I know, Socrates? How do you know? I have seen chicks walk into parties and even the women stop talking and look at them. Yep. Yep. That's how it is when I walk in. Well, that's because that, that can have other causes actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like if a, who's a handsome man, who's an 11, who's a 10. Oh gosh. Brad, Brad Pitt in uh Oh three. Uh, sure. Cary Grant in 51. Yeah. Like if, if Cary Grant in 1951 walks into a cocktail party, the men don't stop talking and turn and look. It's just hmm. not the same. C Cary Grant ain't got nothing on Grace Kelly. Hmm. This is, it sounds like opinion, what I'm saying here, but I think if we could somehow come up with uh What if Frank Zane walked in? Frank Zane? Yeah, is bodybuilder. He... Oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger at his peak. Yeah, but that, but that's different. Those guys are oddities. That's like if a purple elephant backed into the room. That's that's for a different reason. Like if I walk in and hit some, crash some symbols together, everybody would stop talking and looking too. It's not the same thing. The beauty of the male figure is not something as evident to us. No, it's, it's obscured by all that hair and dander. <laughs> I swear, if a 23-year-old Angelina Jolie walks in and everybody has their back turned, they know it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I had that experience. I might have told you. I, I was, uh, this is mid-90s. I was in a, I was in a seminary, which is all dudes. Okay. For a couple of years. And we had a talk. Or at least they used sometimes... to be. What was that? I said, or at least they used to be. <laughs> they used to be. Yeah. And occasionally the girls from St. Joe's would come over. There's a college nearby, which, by the way, has – this is St. Joseph in Philadelphia. They have the most ugly, in my opinion, chapel on that campus that I've ever seen. I don't know if she was an 11, at least an 8, strong 9. I don't know. I never actually got a great look at her. Well, but I was sitting in the front. I had to sit in the front so I wouldn't fall asleep in classes. So I, that was my trick. I figured that out in grad school, sitting in the front. And she walked in, and the whole room turned around. With no communication, nobody said, hey, young men who are considering a, a life vowed to celibacy, <laughs> a beautiful <laughs> creature just came in. No, we just knew. It was weird. Yeah, yeah they suck all their oxygen out of the room. Yeah, so that's what Hippias yeah. is talking about, I think. Yeah, but it's it 
you know, how do you define it? And I, I like this idea of it being appropriate. I think appropriate is very good. But in that case, when that young lady came into the room, most of us were actually being pretty good. We weren't looking at her and figuring the appropriateness of pursuing her as a mate and picking up on her fertility cues. Especially when you turned around, like you have this sense that there's something that you shouldn't miss behind you. There's nothing nothing going on there. Once you turn around, all bets are off, but until your head swivels her. Yeah, so I like the appropriateness. I, I don't think it's all. Right. So appropriateness is one thing, like fitness for use or pr- purpose is one thing. Telos. Mm-hmm. But the the thing that Socrates has a lot of trouble with, it comes up here on 292. This would be the other part you're talking about. He really, he just has trouble with like definitions and adjectives. I mean, we all do. We all do. This is the problem of language, getting language to map onto these universals so we all know which universal we're pointing to. And then these universals aren't, they aren't all, even though they're universal, there are aspects to universals that aren't. There are women. We know what those are. Got a pretty good idea. But then there are blonde ones and brunette ones. Those predicates cause him trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the starting there at about 292, 292B, something like that. He's struggling with that uh, because he talks about, uh, do you think it's wrong for a man to be whipped when he's seeing such a dithyramb? So he, he sings a bad song or he sings a song badly. That's the right way to say it. He sings a song badly. And he says, as that, so raucously, way out of tune with the question. He's saying, do you think that guy should be beaten for singing it badly? So is a dithyram bad or just bad ones bad? Is he bad for singing it badly? And then they go into some other problems here with intent and capability and all kinds of weird stuff. Well, you'd want to be able to say that still doesn't get to sing a song badly doesn't tell you what badly means. He does make a list, way out of tune, raucously. Well, flip it. How would you know when it's sung well? What does the well mean? Let's talk about Roseanne Barr singing the national anthem. <sighs> Rem- remember well, that? Would that would be bad. I remember how co- it. Yeah, how come? It was memorable. Well, that's good. But it was not fine. I typed in Rat- Roseanne Barr in YouTube, and it says... Auto populates Roseanne Barr national anthem, Roseanne Barr Joe Rogan. Do you think it's listening or you think that's like the top? Do you think that's the top one? It's always listening. Let's listen to a little bit, shall we? Do we have to? Yeah, it's so funny. Go ahead. Jack Murphy Stadium. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Now, who is who is the better singer? The one who sings badly on purpose or the one who sings badly without intending it? Because I think she might have done that on purpose. She might have done it on purpose. Yeah. And that'll be what the, the second dialogue, if we ever get to it, is about. Yeah, that one's a big one for me. Is the national anthem fine? Uh, not that one. Why? It's the national anthem. She sang out of tune. But it's the national anthem. She sang anthem. with poor quality. I know, but it was not done well. And I know I'm dodging the question because what does it mean to do it well? well I suppose. Okay, in tune. In tune. And then I'm going to say in tune, I could define mathematically. So that's good. 
quality of voice. I'm not sure I could define that. She sounds awfully nasal and terrible to me. Do you want to hear Lady Gaga sing it? <sighs> I guess. He's just watching my face for my reactions here. I know, yeah. Yeah, pretty straight ahead. Not too bad. Better. She's still... She's got her soft palate dropped. She's a little nasal. Well, have you seen her beak? <laughs> it's it's um, quite a promontory. Uh, and it's too slow. It's a waltz, darn it. Dun 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 People do it too slow. Uh, finer, I guess, but how do I define it? You know, we did our, we just did a, a show on Joe Cocker, and his voice is terrible, or it's awesome. Right. This is a hard question. Is it a question that matters? Yeah. Why does it matter? Um, if we're going to create things that are good and beautiful and true, we have to figure out how to do that. Right. So we need to know something of beauty. Uh, well, how would we... I suppose we could compare... I just can't stand her name. I have a hard time saying it. Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. <laughs> with uh, Roseanne Barr. And you can make some divisions and say, well... Oops. But in the yeah. end, how do you make the decision? Well, this is where the appropriateness fails a bit, because I don't care about the appropriateness. I'm not using those performances for anything. I'm, You're not? If I'm using them for anything, it, it's pleasure. If I'm going to listen to a singer, it's because of the pleasure that comes from it. Oh, God. We have to listen to Fergie. Which is that. something... <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> So oh gosh. At the twilight's <laughs> last gleam, and bright stars. This is really interesting. Rain. We're gonna have to go to Lesser Hippias now. This is really interesting. She can control her voice. The quality of her voice isn't bad. Um, she can sing. Her stylistic choices here are horrific. Horrific. Is what she's doing worse than what Roseanne was doing? I think so. Maybe. She's making it into a... Torch song. Yeah. So you think... You have to think of the appropriateness. I mean, there's the appropriateness. The Star Spangled Banner is a song. What's it about? We only ever sing the first voice, first verse, pardon me. You've gone through the battle. You've been shelled all night, and you look over to see if the flag is still flying. It's about war. You know, people are getting killed. To sing it as a torch song, you don't even care about the lyric. Just vamping your way through it. I bet she was wearing something when she sang that maybe a little she looks great <sighs> you think so i mean listen she's ser she's serving her purpose <laughs> she's like, oh, she looks great what are you talking about it's inappropriate to me and inter it is inappropriateness makes something not to be fine that's for sure. It doesn't necessarily make it beautiful, I think. I think I think that fig spoon, that fig figwood spoon, is the appropriate spoon to stir your bean soup, and I need to acquire one. I don't know if I would call it beautiful. And there is a lot more to this discussion. Make sure to check back next week for part two. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.